close to the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis. Uh, a little bit of another announcement on a different note. I had received news last Sunday evening that Brother Dan Cheetah has surrendered to the ministry. So possibly some of you had already known that. Some of you may have not. Genesis chapter number 41. Genesis chapter 41. And we will begin our reading there in verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Now, beloved, before we can move on in depth into the message this evening, there's some things that we would like to point out with regards to verse number 1. And that is, if you remember back in chapter number 40, Joseph had interpreted the, the dreams of the butler as well as the baker, and after he had interpreted the dreams of the butler as well as the baker, he had made the request, I pray thee that you would make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. That was Joseph's request. Well, we see right there, beloved, in chapter number 41, and it came to pass at the end of two full years. For whatever reason, the Lord was pleased to leave Joseph there in that prison for an additional two years after all of those things had transpired. From what I understand, he was in prison for 11 years total. And lo and behold, beloved, we may in our minds, we may uh, hopefully stand in amazement at what God was doing in the life of Joseph. What I mean by that, beloved, is because we serve a sovereign God, God could have given Pharaoh that dream any time that he wanted to. God could have given Pharaoh that dream the second day that the butler was back. God could have given them that dream any time at all. But instead, God chose to wait for two years for Joseph to stay there in that prison house for that period of time. Now, once again, beloved, we want to point out the fact that there are times in the lives of the Lord's people, beloved. We see it in the life of Moses, that Moses ended up spending 40 years on the backside of the desert. And lo and behold, the Lord used that, those years in order to prepare Moses for the task. Would 38 years have done for Moses on the desert? That's a long time. You would think you could learn a lot in 38 years, but for whatever reason, the Lord said, no, 40 years is what it's going to take. Once again, the Apostle Paul, three years in, in Arabia, beloved, with regards to the start of his ministry. And oftentimes when we look, we as a human being, or we as human beings, if you will, we can become somewhat impatient at times in our lives. Now, we're not saying Joseph was impatient, but there are times that we come to those places in our life that we can feel somewhat impatient. There are times that the Lord will put us in the waiting room of life for whatever reason, and we will not always understand why we're in the waiting room of life. We will not understand why the Lord is not more actively working in our lives in a manner that is made manifest to us. But for whatever reason, beloved, there are times that the Lord will be pleased to leave us in those positions, those situations, and we may not always understand them. But I would encourage you, beloved, wherever you are in life this evening, maybe you feel as though you're shut up in a prison house somewhere. The Lord's not giving you the liberty to move forward. Or maybe the Lord's already moved you forward. Maybe the prison house is yet ahead for you. But as children of God, we must always remember, beloved, that our Heavenly Father holds our lives in the palm of His sovereign hand. And there's absolutely nothing... Not even one moment that transpires, but what the Lord is in control of that moment. And we must always rest in his sovereignty, resist the urge, if you will, to run or to buck or to take off, but rather, beloved, rest in the sovereignty of God. Now, once again, and it came to pass the end of two full years that Pharaoh had dreamed a dream, and behold, he stood by a river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind and fat flesh, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean flesh, and stood by the other kind up on the brink of the river. And the ill-favored kind and the lean-favored kind, I'm sorry, the lean flesh kind, did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind, so Pharaoh awoke, awoke. Have you ever had a dream that left you somewhat puzzled after you dream it? Have you ever had a dream? Man, man, lo and behold, you might have the dream in the middle of the night, and you will wake up from that dream, and you will be so perplexed. Now, we want to also mention this with regards to dreams, and that is that we must be very careful because Sometimes people believe that God is speaking to them in dreams. Now, once again, this is a, a, it's a 
fine hair to try to split here. We are not limiting God's ability or God's capacity to speak to someone in a dream. Not at all. God has that power. But what we are saying, beloved, is that any time that we have a dream, you see, the danger is that there are times that people will have a dream and they will take and say, well, I know what God showed me in the dream. I know what God showed me in my dream. But yet, if you will take and say, well, can you back that up with the scripture? And sometimes it will even be in disagreement with the word of God, but they will take and say, well, it was a personal message from God to me. And though I may not be able to back it up with the word of God, because it was a personal message, I put more stock in that dream than I do in the word of God. You're treading a dangerous path whenever you walk down that. Very, very, very dangerous path. Because let me tell you folks something. The Lord is not the only one who has the capacity to give an individual dreams. And I've seen many people led astray by such things as that. But at any rate, this, this is the dream that Pharaoh had. And then in verse number 5, the Bible says, And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. How many of you have ever dreamed the dream and forgot it by the next day? Many times. You'll be sitting there thinking, man, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I was wide awake. I was puzzled at that dream, trying to figure out what it was. And then, lo and behold, it may be gone by the next day. But in this particular case, beloved, the Bible says there in verse 8, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that, it could, that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Now, who else did we see this take place with? Anybody remember? Who was it? Yeah, the butler and the baker. There was someone else, though, a notable king. In the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar. He was there saying, tell me what the dream is. Tell me what the dream is. Well, lo and behold, beloved, there is something about that, that the Lord uses dreams. And we also want to point this out to you folks as well this evening. The Bible tells in the book of Proverbs that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Now, beloved, may we take heart in this, because there are times when we... We as a nation, we may end up with a government leader that we do not necessarily like, one that we do not agree with, one that we wish would get voted out of office sooner rather than later. Beloved, may I remind you folks of this? The Bible tells us that we are to pray for those who, have, those who are in authority over us. And beloved, I find it's easier in my life at times to complain about government leaders than it is to pray for them. There are times that if we're not careful that we can almost feel like, well, I can pray for the members of the church. I mean, I know that they're on submission to the Lord, but someone as wicked as a, a corrupt government leader, I'm not going to waste my time praying for them. But, beloved, do they not stand in great need of our prayers? Does God not have just as much power in the White House to work as he does in the church house to work? Absolutely he does. We see God working here in the life of Pharaoh. And lo and behold, it tells us there at the end of verse number 8, And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler. Now notice this, beloved. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Oh, beloved, do you not see how beautifully... God layers all of his providence, one thing right beside another, another thing crossways of those two, another thing running alongside of those two. But in God's sovereign providence, beloved, he brings all of these things together. And he had for a period of time the chief butler in prison with Joseph. And lo and behold, the chief butler had had his dream. And once again, it took two years for it to finally transpire. But in the fullness of time, the butler finally comes forth and says, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my fault this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house 
both me and the chief baker, and we dreamed a dream, and one night, I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew servant, to the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams to each man according to his dream he did interpret. Now, beloved, once again, we can look back at that and say, well, why did the king end up mad at the chief butler and the baker? What was, what was the tiff that took place between them? It really doesn't matter what the tiff was, but we know one thing for sure. God wanted those two men, the butler and the baker, to be in prison. God wanted them to be in prison with Joseph. God gave those men their dreams. God put Joseph in a position that he interpreted those dreams. And finally, it comes about full circle, and now Joseph is front and center once again. And as it says there, beloved, it says, And there was with us a young man, an Hebrew servant, to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams, to each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was, me he restored into mine office, and him he hanged. Such a dramatic event in the life of the butler and yet how forgetful he was of what God had done. But I want you to take careful notice there, verse number 14, where the Bible says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Beloved, to the best of our knowledge, and according to the Scriptures, this is the last time that Joseph ever had to wear prison raiment in his lifetime. Joseph's life was about to take such a huge transformation externally that it would almost be hard for us to even be able to conceive it. There he is in prison. There's someone else who has control over Joseph, and lo and behold, Joseph is not at liberty to come and go as he pleases. He's not at liberty to exercise all of his will and all of these things. But lo and behold, beloved, once again, in the fullness of time, as the Bible says, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine being in prison? You do not really know what exactly is going on, but lo and behold, someone comes in, they say, hey... Get up out of yourself. Pharaoh wants you and he wants to talk to you now. Can you imagine what would have been going through the mind of Joseph? Can you imagine even as they would have said, and it says there, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Could you imagine standing there before Pharaoh for the very first time that you had met him? And lo and behold, as he stands there, Pharaoh is not shy about it. Verse 15, the Bible says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I've dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And once again, Pharaoh, then he goes on. We will not read all down through it again. But Pharaoh proceeds on to tell Joseph his dream. And lo and behold, as he tells Joseph his dream, Joseph interprets that dream absolutely perfectly. It makes sense in the mind of Pharaoh. And God empowers Joseph to be able to carry out the duty which was there before him. Now, beloved, when we consider this, May I encourage you folks, sometimes we may feel as though our lives are somewhat insignificant. Imagine Joseph being there for 11 years and in that passage it says that they brought him out of the dungeon. Sometimes we may feel as though our lives are somewhat insignificant. In other words, there may be times in our life that we feel like, well, I'm... I'm just, I'm living here in Lexington. I'm just trying to be faithful. I, I'm really not setting the world on fire, but I'm just trying to be faithful where the Lord has put me at. Beloved, do not ever underestimate the circumstances which God has placed you in. Don't underestimate it. You never know at what point the Lord may bring someone into your life that he would have you to be able to minister to. Don't underestimate it. Don't ever come to the point that you run into the grocery and you feel like, well, uh, here's an opportunity to talk to the cashier, but I'll tell you what, I got ice cream waiting. I didn't want my ice cream to melt. I'm going to run home and eat this ice cream before it finished melting. I didn't have time for this cashier. 
Beloved, the cashiers of this lifetime are those whom the Lord has left us upon this earth for. That's our calling in life. That's our duty. Do not ever underestimate it. Maybe a nurse, maybe a doctor, uh, maybe someone that, that just pops up. You don't even know them. But the Lord will give you that opportunity to be able to minister. After Joseph had interpreted the dream of Pharaoh's, there, skip on down to verse 25. The Bible says, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven kind and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, and let him set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities, and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, and the land that the land, I'm sorry, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Oh, beloved, would it not be the greatest compliment that someone could ever pay to you to take and say, you know what? This working of the Spirit of God, I'm not talking about spiritual gifts speaking in tongue, but what I'm talking about, beloved, is our demeanor, our persona, the way that we carry ourselves in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Would it not be a blessed testimony to have people say that about us? Obviously not for our glory. If anyone tries to glorify us, we need to deflect it on to the glory of God and say it's not about us, it's about God. But as the Bible says there, can we find such a one as this is a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Beloved, there's another thing, another point that we desire to touch on this evening, and that is this. Never lose sight of the fact that Joseph, in one day, one morning, he's in prison. I believe that he had a relatively good place in prison but he was still in prison. And by that evening, his circumstances had changed to the point that he was riding in the second chariot to Pharaoh and arrayed in the finest of linen that all of Egypt had to offer. Now maybe you say, well, Brother Spears, good for Joseph. That's good. We, we love the story of Joseph. Most people do. Even a lot of lost people. They like the narrative of Joseph in the scriptures. But may we take heart in this, beloved, Possibly you're facing circumstances today 
And you may have been in those circumstances for a day, a week, a month, or a year. You may have been in the circumstances for 11 years. I don't know, as Joseph was. But never forget this, beloved. God has the wherewithal to change our circumstances in a drastic, drastic measure in the space of but a moment. But a moment. Now, based on the fact that God sovereignly can change our circumstances, based on the fact that we may wake up one morning in prison garments, and by that evening, beloved, we're dressed in the finest of lemon. Lemon, amen. It's bitter, too. Dressed in the finest of linen. Most of you, I, I snuffed that right over most, most of you. I think Brother Hart got it, amen. Based on the fact that we are in the circumstances where God can change things for us in but a moment, how should we live our lives in view of this knowledge? Should that not place within us a blessed hope with regards to the future? For we, the people of God, maybe you're here this evening and you're facing difficult circumstances in sickness. And as you face those circumstances in sickness, maybe you've carried it around for, for quite some time. And you feel as though, I, I don't know when it will ever change. I will promise you this, if you're a child of God, change is going to come. It will come. Maybe you say, Brother Spears, when will it come? Will it come in a, a week, a month, a day, or a year? I know one thing for sure. The moment that you get into heaven, it will all change. But possibly even prior to that, the Lord has the wherewithal to change the circumstance of his people in but a moment of time. And by the same token, maybe you're here this evening, and, and maybe rather than being in ill circumstances or unfavorable circumstances, Maybe you're here this evening and you're in great circumstances. Beloved, I do not know about, about you all, but me being a fallen son of Adam and still possessing my old nature, there are times that, pe that things will be going so well in my life that I'll feel like, you know what, man, this is on easy street. I don't know what it is, but God's done something in my life and he's put me on easy street and I just, I have this feeling it's going to be easy street, smooth sailing all the way on into heaven. Don't be deceived. Because the truth is that the Christian life, if we would study it historically speaking based upon the scriptures, if we study it historically speaking after the scriptures have been given, beloved, throughout all of the years, the Christian life, the normal Christian life is a series of ups and downs, ups and downs. We may be one day rejoicing with all of our heart and singing praise to God. And sad to say, we may find ourselves the next day so depressed that we feel like we don't want to leave the house and in tears. But yet, beloved, I would submit to you this evening that whether it is on the mountaintop or in the valleys, God has a purpose in both, and God has a teaching for us in both places. We may not always enjoy the valleys, but oftentimes we learn as much, if not more, in the valleys than we do on the mountaintops. But here Joseph is... His circumstances have drastically changed. And I wonder for just a young man how he would be taking all of those things in. How would he take them in? In other words, from going to prison to being there in Pharaoh's house. And it says there, notice verse 44 once again. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. In other words, now everything has to go by Joseph. Now nobody's telling Joseph what to do, but instead he's in the position that he's telling everybody else in the land of Egypt what to do. The Bible also made mention a few verses back with regard to the discreetness of Joseph. Sometimes, to be honest, I will see maybe um, someone like in a, a music video singing. They may be singing praises to God. And sometimes I will see TV preachers in which I typically I don't like to watch TV preachers much, to be honest with you. But sometimes I will see people that will profess to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And rather than their lives being marked by a pattern of discreetness, their lives are instead marked by a pattern of pride. Beloved, pride does not become the true child of God. The Bible tells us that the Lord knows how to humble the proud. And thus, whenever we are tempted to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, we need to bear these things in mind. Now on down there, through verse, beginning with the verse 45, And Pharaoh called Joseph, Joseph's name Zaphnath Pananiah, 
And he gave him wife, gave him the wife, Asenath, the daughter of Poti Paria, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. After all of that time, beloved, that he'd spent in the prison house, now he's out there traveling all over Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in cities. In the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city, and laid up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Poti Paria, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me... To, I'm sorry, he had made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenteous that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come upon, as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people came to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all the countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Beloved, that concludes chapter number 41 for this evening. But we would like to point this out. We spoke earlier about the providence of God being laid side by side, being laid one upon another, and the sovereignty of God bringing all of these things into exactly the point where God would have them to be. One of the most glorious aspects of the life of Joseph is when he is reunited with his family. Well, you see, beloved, through this famine, this is exactly what God is about to accomplish in the life of Joseph. God is about to see Joseph reunited with his family, and there's a series of events which takes place in order for that to happen. It is a blessed, blessed passage of Scripture that lies ahead of us for the weeks ahead. But let me point this out in closing this evening. The individual Joseph, from going from being in a pit in the ground to being sold by his brethren to being second in Potiphar's house to being accused and then going into prison, God used the individual Joseph to save how many thousands of lives from starvation? Don't read anything about Joseph having a college degree. I don't read anything obviously extra special about Joseph other than the fact that the hand of God was resting upon his life. Beloved, in all of our lives, we're also indwelt by the Spirit of God. And there are times that we may take and look as though, as we had mentioned earlier, we may look sometimes at ourselves as though we're insignificant or that we're stuck or that we do not amount very much for the glory of God. But yet, beloved, one day we will all be found in that heavenly chorus rejoicing and praising God throughout all eternity. Joseph will not necessarily have a front row seat there that he's any better than us, but all who enter into heaven, they do so because they have trusted in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. There's one way to find salvation, and that is in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do not know him this evening, to be honest, you're living a life that is somewhat in disarray. You see, God has created us to bring glory and honor unto him. And this is the chief purpose of all of our lives. This is the highest calling of our lives. Not to glorify ourselves, not just to simply have a good time upon this earth, because that's what all the lost people do upon this earth. But for the children of God, we have been called to a great and holy calling to glorify God in all situations at all times. Beloved, may it be true of us that we walked with the Lord, that we have sought to glorify the Lord through every step of the way of our lives, the good times and the bad. 
I oftentimes think of the former members of Bryan Station, those who had died in the faith, those who have died as members here, beloved, those in the 1700s, the 1800s who have died, and the sacrifice that they gave. And, you know, possibly a few of those people, they may have gotten to the point that they were so old that when they would enter in the church, they would just barely creep and crawl along, and they probably felt like, well, I should say they could have felt like, you know what, all I'm doing is filling the pew. I'm not setting the world on fire. I'm just filling the pew. I'm just trying to be faithful. But here's the point, beloved. Because of their faithfulness, simply being in the house of God, because of the faithfulness of those people, we have a church to be able to come to today. It is because of the perseverance of the saints. These three young men over here, this is our new amen section. Amen? amen. Come on a little bit louder. Our amen section. Amen. amen. You know, one day, by the grace of God, these boys will be raising their families in this church by the grace of God, unless the Lord returns first. Beloved, may we be faithful to the calling which God has placed upon our lives, whether it's being able to minister to hundreds of thousands or being able to simply support our local church. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll be dismissed in prayer.